Perfect. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking Kevin and the team for inviting me to present. Uh, I am a professor of radiation oncology and urology and medicine uh, at the University of California at San Francisco. And today I'll be talking about the potential of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing of ctDNA as a biomarker of response in metastatic prostate cancer. So here are my disclosures. So I, when I'm not doing uh, laboratory science, I lead one of the uh, big clinical trials groups in the United States, NRG, RTOG. I lead their GU Cancer Committee, and that gets me involved in a lot of pharma. I hope that by being conflicted with everybody, I'm not conflicted with anybody. But um, uh, anyway, so I wanted to begin with uh, describing an overview of prostate cancer progression. And so many of you might know this, but uh, most patients are diagnosed with prostate cancer following an increase in PSA levels. So PSA is the y-axis here, and time is the x-axis. And what happens is that uh, many patients will undergo treatment for their prostate cancer with either surgery or radiation, which actually leads to the cure of uh, a majority of patients. But unfortunately, there's going to be some patients, a significant subset, whose PSAs recur uh, following um, treatment for prostate cancer, and then they're initiated on first-line androgen deprivation therapy called ADT. Most of those patients will actually, uh, ADT will control the disease for quite some time. But at some point in time, these patients will develop resistance to ADT, and they're initiated on second, third, and fourth line therapies at that time. And I think one of the key issues in prostate uh, cancer is that there's a critical need to develop biomarkers of response to systemic therapy for patients with advanced prostate cancer. And so today, I've broken up my talk into two uh, different portions. Portion number one is to uh, discuss what we have learned so far from biomarker studies in metastatic cash rate resistant prostate cancer, and I'm going to make five key points there. And the second part of my talk is uh, going to focus on the potential of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing as a liquid biomarker in metastatic uh, cash rate resistant prostate cancer, which I'm going to abbreviate MCRPC from here on out. So starting the five key points. So point number one, we know that biopsies are not routinely obtained in metastatic uh, castor resistant prostate cancer patients, so non-invasive biomarkers are needed. And so uh, kind of case in principle, seven years ago at UCSF, we started an international multi-institutional effort to ob obtain metastatic biopsies from MCRPC patients. And now we have one of the largest biorepositories of MCRPC samples in the world, uh, metastasis from around 400 unique patients. And uh, as you can see from the bottom, we published a lot of genomic studies trying to characterize the biology of that disease from the metastases. Uh, however, during that same time period, the institutions involved in this effort treated approximately 8,000 MCRPC patients, give or take. And what that means is that despite our best efforts to try to biopsy as many patients as possible, we really biopsy about one out of 20. Um, and so it's clear that there's a need for non-invasive biomarkers. And in fact, point number two is that a non-invasive biomarker assay uh, has recently been improved to select MCRPC patients uh, for PARP inhibitor by the FDA. And so this is results from the Triton 2 trial published by Wasim Abida and JCO recently. And this was a, a single arm phase two study in patients uh, with MCRPC with BRCA1 or 2 alterations who were treated with the PARP inhibitor recaparib. And here you can see from this waterfall plot that there was actually a high percentage of patients with confirmed radiographic response, which is expected in this patient population. Now, the key part I want to bring up today is that the Foundation One Liquid Companion Diagnostic Assay, which is a targeted sequencing assay for ctDNA, was recently approved by the FDA uh, as a companion diagnostic for selecting MCRPC patients uh, with BRCA1-2 mutations for treatment with this PARP inhibitor. And so in the United States, this, uh, these liquid biopsies are going to become standard of care. So the third point I want to make is that plasma CT DNA sequencing can capture the heterogeneity of treatment resistance in MCRPC. And so it's going to take me a few slides to make this point, so bear with me. But uh, we biopsy patients before initiation of treatment and at the time of development of treatment resistance, in this case with regards to PARP uh, inhibitor uh, treatment with talazoparib. And so here's an example of a patient who basically uh, uh, was treated with talazoparib uh, responded for six months and then started developing resistance. And what we were looking for in this patient was what we call reversion mutations or deletions. And I'm giving you a schematic of what this is that we were looking for. 
So in a in the normal cells from a patient with a BRCA2 germline alteration, that patient has one functional copy of BRCA2 and one copy of BRCA2 that harbors a pathogenic mutation shown here with the star that usually leads, leads to truncation uh, of the gene and a non-functional uh, copy of BRCA2. When the patient develops a metastasis or cancer prior to therapy with PARP inhibitor, what happens is that they lose uh, the functional allele and they're left with a single copy of the pathogenic allele that, that again, uh, uh, doesn't make any functional BRCA2. What happens after PARP inhibitor therapy is that they pick up a second deletion that restores BRCA function. And what it does is it basically cuts out the pathogenic mutation, um, puts everything back in frame, and you end up with a functional in-frame BRCA2 protein that's just a little bit smaller. And so what we've shown is that you can detect these BRCA reversions in patients. And so here is a, um, a genome map from a uh, BRCA2 patient. And on the top, you can see um, his germline. Uh, sample. And what, what you can see is that um, there's a pathogenic mutation in BRCA2 shown in the yellow that's present about in 50%, at a 50% prevalence and consistent with, you know, one pathogenic allele. Um, what happens is that in his cancer sample before any, any treatment with PARP inhibitor, you see enrichment uh, of that pathogenic allele consistent with loss of heterozygosity, meaning he's lost the wild type uh, BRCA2 copy um, uh, in his cancer cells. Now, after treatment with PARP inhibitor, what you see is you see this big old gap or canyon uh, in his genomic coverage. And that corresponds to a large deletion, D1 here, that basically crosses through the pathogenic mutation and basically deletes out the pathogenic mutation, putting BRCA2 back in frame. And there's also a second deletion at a lower prevalence in this particular biopsy sample. Now, this is all previously, what I've shown you so far was from tumor samples. Now let me show you the data from the circulating DNA. And what you can see is in this patient, there are now uh, seven detectable uh, uh, reversion mutations, all basically putting BRCA2 back in frame. <clears throat> and actually in this paper that we published a few years ago, we actually had a second patient that had 34 different reversion mutations in the plasma, uh, 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 in the CT DNA. Um, and what you can imagine is from a simplistic perspective, that perhaps this patient had 34 different metastases and when you treat uh, with PARP inhibitor, you put on such a selection pressure that in order for a metastasis to survive, it has to figure out a way to revert BRCA2. And each of these different metastases manage to revert BRCA2 in a different way. And so again, this point I want to make is that you can use CTDNA to capture this heterogeneity. Now remember, I have five points to make. So point number four is that alterations in the non-coding genome can actually confer treatment resistance <coughs> in metastatic uh, CRPC as well. Um, and so we performed a whole genome sequencing study that was published uh, two years ago. Um, and it was the first kind of landscape study of whole genome sequencing done in MCRPC. And what's clearly known in MCRPC is that there's uh, amplification of chromosome X around the location of the angina receptor. But we performed uh, our sequencing with such a depth that we were able to start resolving exactly where the peak of that amplification was. And it's conventionally been thought that that amplification was in the angina receptor gene body shown here. But lo and behold, what we, you can see from the red arrow is that the peak of the amplification is about 624 kilobases upstream of the angina receptor. And we did a lot of studies uh, that show that this is an enhancer upstream of the angina receptor amplified in about 80% of MCRPC uh, patients. And actually, these findings were also uh, discovered at, at the same time by two groups from the Broad Institute, led by uh, Matthew Friedman and uh, Matt Meyerson. Um, and, and they actually uh, um, functionally characterize this as an enhancer. But what we all basically showed is that when you don't have amplification of the androgen receptor gene or the androgen receptor enhancer, the, ex the RNA expression of the androgen receptor is actually low. And what happens is that when you pick up the amplification of either the gene body or the enhancer or both, that is enough to significantly increase androgen receptor expression and this is actually a mechanism of resistance to AR-directed therapies. And what's notable is amplification of the enhancer itself without amplification of the gene body is enough to drive this, this treatment resistance. Now, again, this is a non-invasive biomarker conference. And so the point I wanna make is that you can actually pick up these enhancer amplifications uh, with ctDNA sequencing. And so this is a cohort of patients published by a group in Washington University. Um, 
uh, where these patients were all treated with next generation antigen signaling inhibitors, and they basically had ctDNA sequencing of their plasma prior to that treatment. And what you can see is if uh, the patients that had either an alteration of the AR gene body or the ANS enhancer had worse overall survival when treated with androgen signaling inhibitors uh, than the wild type patients. And what those, these findings suggest is that certain non coding alterations should be included in conventional ctDNA panels, and that discovery approaches should include genome wide approaches. Now, five points. Point number five the genomic landscape of MCRPC is uh, not as active as many solid tumors. Um, and so here what you can see, this is a paper um, uh, uh, from Alexandrov and others, um, that basically shows that prostate cancer in terms of mutational load is somewhere in the middle of all cancers. But on the left are a lot of uh, liquid tumors that are dominated by one or two genetic events. And so among solid tumors, it's actually one of the more quiescent ones. And so the push I'm gonna make is maybe we should be looking at the epigenome. So here's a summary of the five key points that I've presented so far. Point number one, tissue biopsies of MCRPC are not frequently obtained. Point two, non-invasive biomarkers are now FDA approved in MCRPC. Point three, ctDNA captures tumor heterogeneity in MCRPC. Point four, a genome-wide discovery approach has merit, and particularly to look for non-coding alterations. And point five, ideally, we should look beyond pure uh, genomic approaches potentially to uh, kind of epi the epigenome and so forth. And why am I trying to make these five points? Because what I'm trying to lead to is the point that 5-hydroxymethylcytosine seq is a ctDNA-based uh, uh, approach. And so that addresses the top three points here. Um, that basically surveys, uh, uh, the, it, it surveys the epigenome. Uh, uh, for gene activation. And so this addresses the final two points here. And so based on the needs and what we know about metastatic prostate cancer, we should consider kind of these genome-wide epigenome uh, 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 approaches in ctDNA. So that was the first part of my talk. At this point in time, I'd like to move to the second part of my talk, which is the potential of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing, which I'll abbreviate 5-HMC from here on out as a liquid biomarker uh, in this disease. And so let me tell you a little bit about 5-HMC. So when we usually talk about DNA methylation, we are referring to the addition of a methyl group to the base cytosine. Unmethylated cytosine is associated with open chromatin, especially at promoters in regions with increased density of cytosine and guanine pairs, and this is called CPG islands. The unmethylated cytosine and open chromatin is associated with gene expression, as you see here. Now, the methylation of cytosine is performed by a family of uh, DMT enzymes or DNA methyl transferases, which basically add a methyl group to the five carbon position of cytosine, which is therefore referred to as 5MC. And this leads to closed chromatin and repression of gene expression. However, it was recently discovered that 5MC is not the only methylation mark, but others exist. And one such modification is mediated by the TET family of enzymes, which basically oxidize the methyl group to a uh, hydroxymethyl group. And this space is now referred to as 5-hydroxymethylcytosine or 5-HMC. This mark is only on the order of a couple percent of the total amount of 5-MC, but is found in gene bodies and on the borders of promoters of highly expressed genes. If this has a biological role it's, uh, in activating transcription or if it's a mark in a region undergoing demethylation, that is not fully under, uh, understood. But what is clear is that it's enriched in transcriptionally active regions. So unlike 5-MC, which is associated with gene repression, 5-HMC is associated with gene activation. And it turns out that after the oxidation event, the cytosine can actually be converted back to its unmethylated state. So whatever is going on, 5-HMC is associated with gene activation. Now, <clears throat> we are actually working with a company called Blue Star Genomics uh, on an adapted approach or optimized approach for detecting 5-HMC marks. Um, and this is a, what we call an adapted HME seal approach. And so what this basically depends on um, is a chemical reaction that specifically adds biotin to 5-HMC moieties on DNA. So here in the red uh, lollipops, you can see 5-HMC moieties. Uh, you biotin label these 5-HMC moieties. Uh, 
Uh, what happens is that then you can perform a pull down with strip avidin beads. You perform PCR amplification of the DNA fragments attached to the beads. Um, and this whole uh, approach actually requires only five to 10 nanograms of input DNA. So one of the reasons we selected this was basically because of the very, very low input amounts. And it's actually now performed in a clinical grade CLIA certified laboratory. And so this technology uh, allows us to ask a couple important research questions. Research question number one is, what is the landscape of five HMC marks in MCRPC tumor samples? And number two is, can 5-HMC be used as a blood-based biomarker of outcome in MCRPC patients? <clears throat> so one thing we have found is that 5-HMC marks are enriched in gene bodies and associated with active transcription. That's actually already known. But what we did was, you know, in our 100 uh, metastatic samples, we performed whole genome sequencing, deep RNA-seq, uh, uh, whole genome bisulfide sequencing, and now 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing. And, and what you can see is that the, uh, when you look at the distribution of 5-HMC marks uh, compared to conventional 5-MC marks, there's enrichment of 5-HMC marks in the gene body shown in, in, in blue. And actually, this uh, plot on the right represents uh, a kind of a genome-wide uh, assessment. And so what we did was basically we took every gene in the genome and we plotted them out by RNA expression level. So purple is the highest uh, our, our, our genes in the top 20% uh, uh, you know, of expression, I'm uh, sorry, um, uh, purple is our samples in the top 20% uh, uh, highest expressors of, of a particular gene, uh, uh, and yellow is basically the lowest 20% expressors, and then on the y-axis is the uh, degree of 5-HMC marks uh, in those genes, and again, this is all aggregated on a genome-wide level. What I wanna point out is between the transcriptional start site and the transcriptional end site, uh, end site you get a nice dynamic range of 5-HMC marks basically correlating with RNA expression. You see a kind of a, a drop here at the transcriptional start site, and this is consistent with a known distribution of 5-HMC marks across the genome. <clears throat> Since we had all this information on, you know, with whole genome sequencing and whole genome bisulfide and RNA-seq and 5-HMC sequencing on the same 100 samples, we then compared how well um, uh, promoter methylation uh, copy number, gain or loss, or 5-hydroxymethylcytosine marks predicted for RNA expression of every gene uh, in the genome. And what you can see here is promoter methylation, shown in pink, is actually negatively correlated with gene expression. So the, the zero line is right here. So the promoter methylation peak is to the left of the zero line, meaning it's negatively correlated with gene expression as expected. And then copy number uh, gain and 5-HMC marks in the gene body have positive correlations with gene expression with 5-HMC outperforming copy number uh, and actually promoter methylation as well. We then asked which genes, uh, for which genes the prediction was strongest. And a gene set enrichment analysis showed that the angiogen response pathway was clearly the most enriched pathway for 5-HMC marks correlating with RNA expression, suggesting that 5-HMC marking of actively transcribed genes is done in a disease-specific manner. We also then looked at uh, uh, how 5-HMC uh, corresponds to gain of oncogene activity in our tumor samples. And so again, uh, you know, on these samples, we have whole genome sequencing that allows us to assess whether there's copy number gain or no gain uh, of these different oncogenes shown here. And what you can see is that when there's copy number gain, there's high AR gene expression by RNA levels shown in blue compared to red. But there's also five, high 5-HMC high marks on AR shown in blue compared to red. And the same trend holds up for MYC, a common oncogene, and also ERG as well. And so ERG is notable because in prostate cancer, uh, a, a number of them have ERG gene fusions that basically turn on the ERG gene. And so when you have ERG gene fusion, you see high ERG, expre uh, ERG expression by RNA levels, but also high ERG as marked by 5-HMC as well. And similarly, you can actually do the similar analysis for tumor suppressor genes, again, in our metastatic samples. And so here you see data for BRCA2 on the left, uh, RB on the top right, P10 on the bottom left, and P53 on the bottom right. And what these bars indicate is the number of alleles lost. So red is two alleles lost, uh, uh, yellow is one allele lost, uh, blue is no alleles lost. Again, this is in the metastatic samples. And again, you can see RNA expression for each gene on the left, 5-HMC uh, marks on the right, and you see basically that 
uh, 5-HMC is really kind of marking out gene expression in these tumor suppressors. We also tried to map out the landscape uh, of 5-HMC marks in metastatic versus localized prostate cancer. And so in addition to our metastatic cohort, we worked with Dr. Hansen He from the Canadian Prostate Cancer Group and profiled an additional 55 localized prostate cancer tissue samples. And this allowed us to start out with a genome-wide global analysis of 5-HMC changes. And we assessed differential 5-HMC marks uh, between localized hormone-sensitive and metastatic CRPC in regions identified to have 5-HMC modifications. And in this figure, we plotted out the most significant changes out over each chromosome. Red basically means that a chromosome locus is gaining um, 5-HMC in metastatic compared to localized disease. And blue indicates that 5-HMC is lost in metastatic disease compared to localized disease. And this analysis readily identified increased 5-HMC signal in known drivers of metastatic prostate cancer, such as MYC, AR, FOXA1 shown here. And interestingly, it's also found uh, a loss of tumor suppressor genes, such as RB shown here. But clearly there are many, many more regions marked by increase or decrease of 5-HMC throughout disease progression. This is an area of further study for my team, but a lot of these pathways actually correlate with uh, reactivation of previously silenced developmental pathways as well. So that's an area of quite uh, of interest. But overall, I think it's safe to say that this technique has the potential to track gene activation uh, and activity uh, loss of drivers of metastatic prostate cancer. Now, the other thing we did is, this is a non-invasive biomarker conference, so we also decided to look in ctDNA samples. So we had 29 samples from patients uh, where we had matched uh, um, the matched metastatic biopsy and also a ctDNA sample uh, uh, from that same patient from the plasma. And what we did was we started measuring 5-HMC in the ctDNA, and we recognized that actually there was concordance uh, across the board, but the degree of concordance between 5-HMC in tissue and in cell free DNA varies based on the biological pathways. And so here, basically, you can see for all protein coding genes, the concordance is around 0.3. So there is a concordance, but it's not super, super high. But when you look at prostate cancer-specific genes uh, or androgen response genes shown in the green and in the orange, they actually have the highest degree of concordance when you're mapping between the metastatic biopsy and cell-free DNA. And remember, the cell-free DNA probably uh, uh, um, uh, it represents many, many different metastases. Um, and the biopsy only represents one metastasis. So the fact that this level of concordance is as good as it is was actually shocking uh, to us. So this was actually uh, a reasonable result. Now, one point I want to make is that cell-free DNA found in the circulation can come either from tumor cells or normal cells, most commonly leukocytes. And many publications have described that the amount of tumor DNA and cell-free DNA correlates with overall disease burden and is prognostic. Now, methylation is tissue and cancer-specific, and it's been shown, for example, uh, by Gert et Hard's group, uh, that methylation patterns in cell-free DNA can be used to estimate the amount of tumor uh, in a cell-free DNA sample. So we therefore hypothesized that five HMC patterns could be used to estimate cancer content in a liquid biopsy. So we used our tissue samples and we created a five HMC classifier that could predict the amount of prostate cancer in a given sample. And then we tested this classifier in a set of 64 samples collected at the University of British Columbia by Alex Wyatt and colleagues. And these samples are from men with metastatic castro-resistant prostate cancer prior to the initiation of the first line of uh, uh, next generation androgen signaling inhibitors. So the 5-HMC is shown here, uh, predicted for prostate cancer content in cell-free DNA. Um, uh, and what, what, what's more is that we, we end up, ended up splitting our samples into tertiles of low, medium, and high prostate cancer content based on the 5-HMC. And the amount of prostate cancer as defined by 5-HMC sequencing was highly prognostic for overall survival. And so in summary, 5-HMC levels can be, alone can be used to estimate cancer content in a sample, which is prognostic and then opens up a use for 5-HMC, uh, uh, you know, for example, in evaluating um, uh, treatment response. Now, we also wanted to test uh, in cell-free DNA the finding from our tissue analysis that 5-HMC gains, uh, detects gains and losses of common oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes during progression 
uh, of metastatic uh, CRPC. And therefore, we selected a, a set of common driver genes in MCRPC, both oncogenes and tumor suppressors as shown here. We basically then tested if the number of oncogenes with gained activity or the number of tumor suppressors with lost activity as determined by 5-HMC marks was associated with prognosis. High activity of oncogenes was defined as the highest quartile of 5-HMC levels, and low activity of tumor suppressor genes was defined as the lowest quartile of 5-HMC. And so this was very strongly prognostic for survival in cell-free DNA. And uh, what's important is that this adjusted p-value represents the p-value after adjusting for the ctDNA fraction, which I think is particularly impressive given that this particular cohort wasn't quite large. And so as many of you know, one of the major limitations of the ctDNA field is that the ctDNA fraction or the amount of cancer DNA um, in the plasma is so prognostic by itself that it's hard to beat that. But here, what we show in even this small cohort is that you can beat it and you can, I'm not, you can, you can, uh, you can provide additional prognostic value even accounting for ctDNA fractions. And so, you know, what I think this shows is that we demonstrate that 5-HMC sequencing can be used to infer activity of gain and loss of common oncogenes and tumor suppressors in MCRPC, and it certainly has biomarker potential. Now, in the same samples, we had conventional targeted ctDNA sequencing. So we had 5-HMC sequencing, and then we had just our conventional targeted ctDNA panel. And so here are overall survival curves based on, you know, just looking for AR uh, alterations in the DNA or MYC alterations or RP1. And uh, here are the same results looking at 5-HMC inferred activity from the same genes, AR, MYC, and RP. And it's pretty much the same. The reason why the colors are flipped on the RP1 is that RB loss by ctDNA sequencing is shown in red. Um, but when you have 5-HMC and you're looking for marks, you want the presence, uh, uh, sorry, the absence of, of uh, uh, five HMC marks is shown in blue. So it's pretty much the same result. And overall, what it means is that you can almost uh, recapitulate results from conventional targeted CT DNA panels um, with five HMC sequencing. Now, what I've shown you so far is that five HMC sequencing can be used to estimate tumor fraction in the plasma or, or CT DNA fraction in the plasma, and that it can basically recapitulate the results of conventional targeted CT DNA sequencing. But in order for it to be a promising biomarker, it has to do more than that. And so what we did is we started looking at genes that are not uh, conventionally or commonly altered by genomic changes, uh, such as TOP2A and EZH2 in prostate cancer. And the reason we selected these genes in particular is that we and others have previously collaborated on a study showing that high expression of TOP2A and EZH2 identify an aggressive subgroup of prostate cancer. And what we show actually is that when you measure top 2A and EZH2 uh, 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 levels by 5 H, by activation by 5-HMC and cell-free DNA, this again is very prognostic. So if you have high top 2A and EZH2, it's really bad outcomes compared to just having a high of, of one of these. Um, and 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 you know the 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 point I want to make again is that you know uh, top 2A and EZH2 are not included in conventional CT DNA sequencing panels primarily because they're not genomically altered, they're not copy number gained or lost routinely. And so again, uh, th this really um, uh, kind of provides kind of uh, uh, some additional data of how this technology uh, kind of gives us additional information beyond conventional ctDNA sequencing. So in conclusion, 5-HMC sequencing identifies gene activation of MCRPC. Number two, 5-HMC adds independent information of gene expression levels uh, in tumor samples. In cell-free DNA, 5-HMC can be used to track the amount of prostate cancer. It can infer the activity of key oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And it's a genome-wide assay and can infer activity uh, of, of genes that aren't conventionally altered uh, in, in, by, by copy number gain or loss or mutation. And therefore, it can identify um, additional prognostic or predictive uh, groups um, that other technologies may not be able to do at this point. That being said, I'm only showing you very preliminary data. Um, you know, I could actually talk about this for another half hour, um, but I'm gonna try to finish on time. And what I will emphasize is that we need a lot of additional work to optimize and validate these results in larger cohorts. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging the large uh, team of collaborators uh, that I have the privilege of working with. 
Um, really, uh, I, I want to acknowledge our colleagues at Blue Star Genomics. I want to acknowledge Alex Wyatt, who provided us uh, the metastatic cell free DNA samples, Hanson Hugh, who provided the localized prostate cancer samples, Eric Small, who's our clinical leader that, that of our metastatic biopsy procurement program, and David Quigley, uh, who um, uh, uh, is our computational uh, uh, co mentor for a lot of the postdocs. And then the, the one person I really, really need to uh, acknowledge is, oh, he's. <laughs> This is his acknowledgement slide, so he's not on here, but Martin Schroestrom is a postdoc in my lab who uh, basically spearheaded the five HMC studies and deserves a ton of the credit. So anyway, thank you for your time and your attention.